Coming in at number 10 is Hybrid. Hybrid is the fusion of four of the five Life Foundation symbiotes into a single symbiote. Riot, Lasher, Phage, and Agony all melded together and bonded to Scott Washington, a guard at the Vault, the supervillain prison. Allowing them to go free, Scott was fired and went through a pretty rough time, losing the use of both of his legs as well as his brother. Four symbiotes, after reuniting with Scott, bonded with him, giving him back the ability to walk. The symbiotes, funnily enough, actually try to curb the anger inside Scott, but then again, since his symbiote was originally four different entities, Scott has to deal with four different voices inside of his head. Kind of a downside in my opinion. Unfortunately, after Scott got his revenge on the ex easy gang that had crippled him, Eddie Brock, Venom, tracked down and took out Washington in order to eliminate all the evil symbiotes, which he didn't even do because the four symbiotes that made up Hybrid survived, were separated, and turned over to the United States government as a special symbiote team. Coming in at number 9 is Scream. Donna Diego was a mentally disturbed woman who eventually became involved with the Life Foundation and later became a host for the last Life Foundation symbiote, the most powerful of Venom's first offspring, Scream. The Scream symbiote had gone off on her own, away from the four that became hybrid. Bonding with Donna, they became a villain at first and encountered both Spider-Man and Venom before she struck out attempting to find a way to peacefully bond with her symbiote. Although Donna was led into a trap and defeated by Venom anyways. Her powers are very similar to other Venom symbiotes except with a few notable exceptions such as her ability to extend her hair into tendrils. Gotta love that prehensile hair. She was also strong enough to defeat all four of her brothers and Scream also controlled Donna's body after the woman had passed away, which is crazy considering symbiotes are parasites and need to live inside a living host to survive. Later on down the line though, after Andrea Benton, who was the host for the symbiote Mania, was possessed with a demonic hellmark, she bonded with a carnage reborn scream symbiote. After it was defeated, the symbiote's remains were taken and used alongside a sample of the anti-venom symbiote to create a brand new version known as Silence, getting a new corruptive touch deadly to other symbiotes. Number 8, Sleeper. The Sleeper symbiote was very different in comparison to others birth of the Venom alien. The youngest son of the Venom, Sleeper was allowed to develop and incubate in a safe environment before attaching himself to a host, which gave it some notable differences and advantages. For starters, Sleeper had an altered appearance and didn't take on some of the characteristics of the Venom symbiote, like the big Spider-Man like white eyes. He also didn't become a killing machine like most other symbiotes. It was mature and cool. Well, maybe a little bit smug. He has increased cognitive functionality, allowing Sleeper to take a much more measured approach to combat rather than just diving in head first like other symbiotes do. Sleeper is actually so intelligent that it lobotomized its host, Telkar, and used him as a puppet in order to avoid being influenced by the Kree warrior. Other than its unique look and intelligence though, Sleeper also developed unique abilities like being able to bend light to camouflage itself and release neurotoxins that can put its enemies to sleep. Pretty neat symbiote if I uh, do say so myself. Number 7, Mary Jane Keeps Her Skin. A very positive Positive revelation, I think. We learned that Moira, although implying to some that she would be wearing MJ's skin to the gala as her outfit, did not actually do that. Well, at least. Not exactly. Not as gruesomely as some of us had imagined anyways. MJ was not directly harmed by Moira, but instead acted as her remote controlled puppet, with MJ wearing a necklace around her neck that was actually Moira's robo hand, which she used to basically control her. Although Spider-Man, also attending the gala in an outfit made especially for him by Jumbo Carnation, did end up sensing something was wrong with MJ and was tipped off by Cypher as to the fact that, you know, she might be in some peril. We have yet to learn of what MJ's fate was was here. Both Spider-Man and Wolverine leapt into action in an attempt to save her from Moira's clutches, but the conclusion of that fight actually won't come until issue number 9 of The Amazing Spider-Man, which is slated for release in September. So we gotta wait a few months to find out what happens next. Sometimes that's how it goes. But I'm just like, what? <laughs> I wanna know now what happens. MJ, are you okay? Are you dead? She's probably not dead. 
but maybe, I don't know. Number 6. Proteus Learns the Truth Initially Orcus planned to out the mutant secret during the gala, but the X-Men beat them to it, spoiling their intention to expose the mutants as liars who had kept the secret from the world. However, Moira still plans to attend the gala in order to end mutant resurrection. Now, Her plan is to reveal the truth of her existence to Proteus and to let him know that well, she never loved him, her son, but that his creation was simply a means to an end for her. Ouch. However, despite being hurt by this, Proteus refuses to believe that the person puppeting MJ is really and truly his mother, even though of course it is Moira. He refuses to basically accept that his mother would say such things to him, and he's basically like, whoever you are, you're not really my mom. Instead of splintering the five, Moira perhaps has only made them stronger as they rush over to defend Proteus against Moira, with Hope declaring that Proteus is a member of their family. The family that is the five, which is super cute. I love when teams are like, we're a family. Family. Number 5. VK Day? VM Day? We don't really know what this is yet, but we do know something big is brewing, and that is honestly enough of a revelation to be concerned with when it comes to Orcus. Near the beginning of X-Men Hellfire Gala, we learn that they have plans to insert a weapon somewhere. What that weapon is, we don't really know. We do know that they're planning on naming a holiday, which will likely be to celebrate the destruction of Krakoa slash mutant kind, either VK Day or VM Day. But what does the V stand for? Virus, maybe? I mean, K probably stands for Krakoa, and M probably stands for like mutants, but yeah. It also seems to be implied that this weapon involves some kind of payload, as we see Dr. Stasis recovering something elsewhere while the gala is going on. And it looks like it could be happening somewhere on Krakoa as well, so I don't know where that is, but it looks suspicious. Doesn't look good. Number four, the secret is out. While technically we knew this story was coming as of X Men issue number 12, the story didn't fully break publicly until the eve of the Hellfire Gala, as seen in an X-Men Hellfire Gala. And much to the shock of Emma Frost, who is once more hosting the gala again this year as White Queen of the Hellfire Gala. Although she should soon be stepping down from that role as we saw in Marauders, the end of the last Marauders series. During the 2021 X-Men, Daily Bugle reporter Ben Urich discovered the mutant secret, that they had power to resurrect any mutants who were lost to them. However, Jean Grey kept the secret safe by removing it from Urich's mind. But then Cyclops and Sink ultimately later decided that this was uh, pretty wrong, and while synced with Jean, Sync would use her powers to return the secret to Yurik, apologizing for ever removing it. Yurik decided to share this knowledge with the world and wrote an article for the Bugle with the headline Immortal X Men. For a closer look at the article that appears in X Men Hellfire Gala shocking mutants all over Krakoa, check out issue number 12 of X Men where you can get a closer look at it. And number three, it's Venom himself. Chronologically, in Marvel Comics, other symbiotes had come before. But Venom was the first to appear, and the one that set the symbiotic ball rolling. After being rejected by Spider-Man, the alien Venom bonded to Eddie Brock, a disgraced reporter who also hated the Spid. The two became a lethal protector anti-hero. Venom is not the strongest of all symbiotes by any means, but he's certainly one of the most persevering. Venom has been tested against more dangerous symbiotes and always comes up on top because he's willing to sacrifice everything to keep the world a safer place. He's proved he can conquer the urges of his race and become a force for good. Because of his unbreakable spirit, Venom was recently powered up by the God of Light itself, allowing him to defeat Null once and for all, allowing Eddie Brock to become the new King in Black. As for the symbiote, Venom has recently bonded with Eddie's son, Dylan Brock, and they are both acting as a hero on Earth. Long before that, though, the Venom symbiote had also been taken by the United States government, sedated, and it was bonded to decorated soldier Eugene Flash Thompson. Thompson's training and great guy morals mixed with the neutered mind of the Venom symbiote gave him control over the alien suit. So he mixed the symbiote's capabilities with his weaponry to become Agent Venom, which was also technically Venom, so I'm including him here as well, just like up before. Number two, Grendel. Grendel himself is a symbiote dragon, which is really cool. He was created billions of years ago by the Clintar or symbiote god Null, manifesting itself from his own blood. The symbiotic dragon, alongside others like him, rampaged across the cosmos for billions of years with the purpose of attacking and slaying pantheons of gods in Null's name. It was actually more like Null was remote controlling the dragons to do his bidding, but hey, you know, tomato, tomato. Grendel is considered far more more powerful than a standard symbiote and is capable of annihilating godlike beings. Standard symbiote weaknesses to fire and sonic weaponry are not as threatening, and these dragons could actually breathe fire and shoot energy blasts. They are extremely fast, traveling through space at speed.
speeds similar to the Silver Surfer, and they're tough as nails. The Grendel could merge with other dragons and symbiotes to create a super large entity, making it even more dangerous. For a time, Carnage was in possession of a fragment of the Grendel symbiote and was able to create his own army, gain the powers of a spirit of vengeance, resurrect Scream and make her part of his army, and was powerful enough to warrant an entire team of A-list Avengers to try and defeat it. Grendel is awesomely terrifying. And coming in at number one is All Black. I mentioned Null when talking about Grendel, but the problem is that Null himself is the god and creator of symbiotes, but he himself is not a symbiote. But being their father, basically, he deserves mentioning at the very least. But for this point though, how about we talk about the very first symbiote he created, All Black. Initially born as the Necrosword was the first symbiote ever created from the shadow of the evil deity and softened with the divine power of a slain celestial head. It was basically a sword created from living darkness and it gives its wielder an exceeding level of power and capability, enough to be able to slay gods. After removing the All Black away from Null, the alien Gore is corrupted by both his hatred of gods and the dark symbiote itself and he continues the butchering of the gods started by Null. Now long after Gore's defeat, in the King Thor timeline, King Thor uses it to stop Galactus from consuming the Earth. But then the All Black connects to Galactus who becomes Galactus the World Butcher. So then when Ego the Living Planet arrives, the All Black goes to Ego and transforms him into the Ego the Necro Planet, who then eats Galactus. Very confusing. But then, the Ego is destroyed by this timeline's Loki, who takes the All Black Necro Sword and becomes Loki the All Butcher. This sword needs to just... Like, chill out for ever, please. It's too much. Number 10, Wizkid. Speaking of the newest team, the current lineup for the X Men just revealed in X Men Hellfire Gala sees Jean Grey, Cyclops, and Sync returning with Forge, Havoc, Magic, Firestar, and Iceman joining them. But someone I would have loved to see on the team would definitely be Wizkid. Wizkid is a mutant who is often underrated when it comes to his powers. Currently, he is part of Sword. At least, he was last when I checked. I feel like I haven't seen Sword in a few issues, but yeah. Wizkid also made an appearance in Cable Reloaded, where he joined Cable's revived team of Exterminators. The Exterminators will be returning as they're going to have their own series, which means Wizkid may actually have his hands full if he's part of that team and on Sword, as he was like back in the day. But I hope at some point in the near future he gets some free time, because I actually feel like he'd be a great addition to the X Men, and is a character deserving of the spotlight he'd rightly receive while on that team. Maybe when current tech whiz and mutant genius inventor Forge is no longer on the team, it will be a good time for Wizkid to step in. Although that being said, I am very glad that Forge has recently rejoined the team because I love Forge and honestly it was about time Forge deserves to be in the spotlight. But we'll see if it sticks as Forge does seem pretty unhappy with some of his teammates currently. I'm looking at you, Scott. Number 9, Maggot. I feel like we've barely seen Maggot at all during the Krakoa times, and I think that is something that needs to be fixed. Maggot did show up in Children of the Atom and was part of a team of mutants that were basically sent out to encourage the Children of the Atom team to reach out to Krakoa and join their mutant brethren. Now, in reality, only one member of that group of major mutant fans turned heroes was actually a mutant, but I still really enjoyed the featured appearance of Maggot there, who the teens also seemed to know by name and were actually like excited to meet, which is super cute. Just the idea of Maggot being a major hero and inspiration to young aspiring heroes the world over is excellent, and his appearance in the Children of the Atom series made me crave having him join the X Men roster once more. And friends, before we move on to this next spot, if you are loving this list, be sure to let us know by giving this video a thumbs up. And you know, let us know down in the comments any mutants that you would love to see on the X-Men team. So many good ones. Number eight, Dr. Cecilia Reyes. Well, you might just think of Dr. Reyes as the mutant medical professional on Krakoa. She's actually much more than that. Medical science might be her calling, but Dr. Reyes is also still a mutant. Her mutant power is force field generation, and although she doesn't always display the best control over these powers, I think she'd still make a valuable member to the X Men team. She also is a decent fighter. I mean, she's not amazing, but she's decent. And one thing that Reyes has that most other mutants don't actually have is a passion, a job 
job, something outside of her mutant identity that shapes who she is, which would likely make her an interesting character to explore in regards to what it can mean to be a hero with or without the use of powers. Number 7 Carnage Carnage is the first major offspring of Venom and he is literally insane. Being a red symbiote, Carnage is quite a bit more volatile than others of his already violent race. He is unpredictable and possibly even stronger than Venom in terms of raw power, but he becomes even crazier after bonding with serial killer Cletus Cassidy. As Cletus was already a serial delifer before becoming Carnage, the extra aggression caused by the bonding with a symbiote only made him more cruel and more dangerous. Carnage was such a threat to Venom that the lethal protector decided to form a truce with his enemy Spider-Man. Carnage was able to create weapons as well as crazier powers like traversing data and phone lines to attack people on the other side. But Cassidy's Carnage is actually pretty weak if you compare him to some of the symbiote's other hosts, like Norman Osborn who bonded with the symbiote and then used his goblin serum to become the utterly terrifying Red Goblin, or when it bonded with a fraction of the power of a symbiote dragon. It even bonds with a great white shark at one point, except other symbiote controlled marine life completely destroy him after Eddie Brock, King and Black, sentenced Carnage to pass away. And at number 6 it is Toxin. The son of Carnage, Toxin was believed to be the most powerful symbiote ever created, being the 1000th symbiote in the lineage of Venom, with Venom being the 998th and Carnage being the 999th. The raw power of Toxin was so great that he was feared even by the King in Black Null, creator and leader of the symbiotes. Carnage became aware that he was pregnant with a new symbiote. However, even before the birth he felt only disgust for his future newborn for fear that it would become more powerful than him, but also because he was grossed out that normally being a male, he could even be quote unquote pregnant with a symbiote in the first place. I don't know, he's kind of weird. He therefore resolved to eliminate his offspring. Luckily for Toxin, Venom, who quickly learned the news, decided to protect the new symbiote and take him under his wing. So. Trained by Venom and bonded with a New York City cop named Patrick Mulligan, Toxin's powers remained restrained and focused on doing purely good. His childlike personality prevented him from unleashing his full power, which is great because he has quite the power set. Toxin resists better heat and sound than other symbiotes. He can track anyone and has all the combined strengths of both Venom and Carnage. More recently, Toxin also developed a venomous bite, which is kind of null and void because his bite alone could probably take out anybody. Mulligan was eventually killed and his symbiote forcibly bonded to Eddie Brock before it found a new host named Bren Waters during the King in Black event. Number 5 Anti-Venom The Anti-Venom symbiote was created when Venom bonded with Eddie Brock after the man was cured of cancer by Mr. Negative. So thanks to Mr. Negative's healing powers, Eddie's antibodies gave birth to a new kind of symbiote when Venom tried to rebond. Inverting the black and white of the original Venom symbiote, Anti-Venom is now mainly white instead of black. Nice. Oh, right, and he has different anti-symbiote powers. His touch is basically caustic to symbiotes and can destroy them with long enough exposure. Antivenom can cure people affected by things like radioactivity, parasites, diseases, and substances. He still has all the enhancements afforded by a symbiote. To make this symbiote even more impressive, Antivenom is resistant to heat and sound, the symbiote's most significant weaknesses. After Flash Thompson, Agent Venom, eventually lost the Venom symbiote, he bonded with an artificial official replica of the anti-venom symbiote that he continues to use even after his death and recent resurrection. So I thought he was like at least worth a mention here as well. Number 4 Bedlam Following Dylan Brock's debut as the new Venom on Earth and Eddie Brock taking on Null's former role as the symbiote king in black, Eddie was traveling the galaxy inhabiting different symbiote bodies when he arrived in the Garden of Time, being transported to the future. While there he encountered other kings in black, with one in particular standing out. Bedlam, who was unstuck in time, was a giant symbiote powerhouse even compared to other kings in black throughout time. Bedlam is unfathomably strong and possesses some rather useful abilities to boot. Like Eddie himself, Bedlam is able to possess and control other symbiotes. He can also project his consciousness into the past and future, allowing him to give Brock a real run for his money. He bites off Brock's arm and is seemingly prepared to devour him completely, though he ends up fleeing after being distracted by Finnegan, which is another king in black. So there's, there's too many of them. 
Way too many. Number three, Karma. What has Karma been up to lately on Krakoa? Well, she's rejoined her fellow mutant friends on the New Mutants team. There were even two New Mutant teams that we got to follow in that series, with the new New Mutants operating on Krakoa and the old New Mutants busy with space adventures. Karma is one of the older mutants in the comics. While not around as long as the classic OG Jack Kirby and Stan Lee team, Karma has been around since 1980, which is still quite a while. She also has has a power that I think is quite OP and horrifyingly interesting, and we've watched her grow into her power over the years. While usually portrayed as being quite a compassionate person, Karma's mutant power allows her to take control over others psychically, allowing her to override her opponent's control over their own body and mind. This makes her not only a powerful character to use, but also an interesting one in terms of the moral dilemma that comes with such an ability, especially with her being a hero. Number 2. Hope Summers Hope has been on and X-Men team before and it was epic. When it comes to characters that would be fun to have on the team just because they're super OP, Hope is definitely one of those. Which is why I'm here for her being on the newest iteration of the team. Of course, I knew it wasn't going to happen this year, but I still really want it to happen at some point in the near future. Hope is too busy of course being the leader of the five on Krakoa who are in charge of resurrections, and of course with recently being elected as a member on the Quiet Council of the Mutant Nation. If you aren't familiar with her, Hope is the adopted daughter of Cable, and was was the first mutant baby following M Day to be born, known as the Mutant Messiah, as a little tyke. Hope's powers allow her to adopt powers of those around her. Now, unlike Rogue, she doesn't actually have to physically touch mutants to take their power, and she doesn't drain their life force energy, so that's a plus. She also gains full control over any powers that she adopts without needing to learn how to master them first. She's just an auto master by default. Number 1. Emma Frost I was actually really hoping that we would see Emma return to the X-Men team this year. Emma has done a lot for the mutant nation of Krakoa since the nation got off its feet. She's not only been busy working on the Quiet Council to help govern the nation, which has been a trying time considering you know, how many secrets Eric and Charles kept from her, but she also has been a driving force behind getting the Hellfire Trading Company up and on its feet as well, acting as their white queen. With the Stepford Cuckoos taking her place, it would free up some time for Emma. However, apparently the rules are, if you are on the Quiet Council, you also can't be on the X-Men. At least that's what Emma seemed to imply during this year's Hellfire Gala. Which I guess would have also written off Hope Summers too, so... Dang, <laughs> can't have either of these people. I, I also like, I feel like there's a lot of people on the Quiet Council that I just would love to have on the X-Men team. Uh, but I guess none of them can be because you're on the Quiet Council, can't be on the X-Men. Makes sense. It's not supposed to be a political team, so kind of makes sense. At number 10 is Despero. Although Despero has always been totally jacked, he was originally known as more of a threat to the Justice League through mind manipulation. During the Silver Age, he would only typically use his telepathic powers before anything else, but these days, it's a different story. Although these changes did start to take place way back in the 80s, the character has come a long way since the days when he would sit on his throne and twiddle his fingers most of the time. Now, he seems to do a lot of the grunt work himself, even looking larger in size these days than ever before. And even outside of the comics, Despero's appearance in the Arrowverse offers a totally different look into the villain. He takes on a human form for much of the time, who is, well, let's just say he's not as big as Despero, nor does he have much musculature to him, no offense to that actor. Nor does he have a third eye or anything that a comic book fan would expect. And when he's in proper form, he just seems a lot less demonic and cunning, more like Hellboy's very serious detective older brother or something like that. At number 9 we have Anton Arcane. The penultimate villain to Swamp Thing, Anton Arcane has always been a threat as one of the most prolific evil scientists in all of DC. But when Swamp Thing finally kills Anton during one of their many confrontations, back in 2016 I think, the villain goes to hell and basically becomes a demon. Having been a pretty tame foe for most of the Swamp Thing comics, Anton Arcane's physical changes have made him almost unrecognizable now that he's a demon. And what's worse is that he continues to bother Swamp Thing and his niece Abigail, but now with the added demonic powers in mind. So he's changed quite a bit, both in looks and power set. At number 8 we have Psycho Pirate. The way that this villain has changed since the Infinite Crisis event is unmatched. Although he looks relatively the same, he's gained such a power boost 
that he now works with the likes of Darkseid and Alexander Luther. After surviving the crisis, he comes out on top, getting his hands on what's known as the Medusa Mask. And what this helps him do is basically summon beings from the old multiverse, which as you can imagine is a very powerful ability, especially directly following the event itself. And even though he's been killed by Black Adam during the events of Blackest Night, Psycho Pirate's corpse is brought back to life as a Black Lantern. And as you can imagine, this gives him a whole new look and increases his power level. He loses the Medusa mask in this ghoulish form, but even without it, he appears totally different than how we're used to seeing him. Number 7, Cypher. Cypher has gotten so much more hyped over the last few years in the comics, and I am super here for it. I feel like Doug has had a major mutant glow up during his time on Krakoa. Well, I know Cypher is busy also being the translator for Krakoa, so that the council might hear its concerns and address them, and so that they might work together with the sentient mutant island. So Cypher is undoubtedly quite busy and in demand already. I would really love to imagine a time when Cypher is free enough to join his fellow mutant heroes on the X-Men team. Cypher's powers make him a master of communication, allowing him to understand all forms of language, including all languages of Earth, alien languages, verbal, written, body language, fighting even as a language, and technology, and so much more than that. So yeah, let's get Cypher back on the X-Men. Cypher's so cool right now. I love him. Number 6, Manifold. Manifold has recently quit his position working with Sword, which would free him up to join the X-Men team. And although he's been on lots of teams, I don't think Manifold has ever, to my knowledge, been a member of the core X-Men team, which I think is a major shame considering how powerful of a teleporter he is and how unique his powers truly are. In a similar but distinctly different manner to Cypher's abilities, Eden Fezzi's true powers lie in the area of communication. That is, he actually teleports by communicating with the universe and asking it to fold for him, allowing him to get the universe to alter itself for him in any way that he wishes, thereby granting him great teleportation abilities as a result. So he's not really like a teleporter, he's really like a mutant, once again, kind of communicator, but he can use that to teleport. Super interesting and super cool. Super underrated. Number 5, Gentle. Gentle is a mutant nominee I have voted for in the past, and I was really hoping that this year was going to be the year that we get to see him rejoin the team. Sadly, not yet. Gentle, for those who don't know, is an amazing mutant who hails from Wakanda. Initially, the story was that Gentle was actually kind of rejected by Wakandan society due to his mixed Russian and Wakandan heritage. But recently, in Black Panther, that backstory has kind of been retconned somewhat. See, Gentle still has the same background in terms of like his heritage, but his story surrounding feeling like an outcast was not entirely true, as he's actually been in the employ and sort of like the back pocket of Wakanda, working for King T'Challa as one of his secret spies for many years. Gentle is Nesno Abedemi. His powers allow him to expand and increase his muscle mass, but unfortunately, his powers left unchecked and uncontrolled are extremely dangerous and could kill him, which is why Gentle is covered with vibranium tattoos, which help him control his abilities and also the symptoms connected with using them. Although later on, we'd actually learn that the pain that's tied to Gentle using his powers was actually psychological and not directly physically tied to the powers at all which has to do with a lot of his family trauma, which now is like, like I said, I don't know, it was kind of, they kind of were like, we're gonna dial that down a bit because Gentle actually loves Wakanda. And I was like, okay, fair enough. But also, maybe not, I don't know. Still processing this retcon. Number four, Madeline Pryor. Madeline Pryor might seem like a strange pick for an X Men team, and fair enough, but Maddie is one of my favorite mutants of all time. And honestly, I feel like she deserves a spot on the X Men team. Okay. So maybe she doesn't deserve, maybe deserve is not the best word, but she would definitely be a super powerful addition and it might help her to heal from a lot of the trauma she still carries, which is honestly what has probably shaped her into being a villain. What I'm saying is I think it's about time that Jean Grey's clone, Madeline Pryor, the Goblin Queen, got a redemption arc. And this could be a good path to do that. Also, I gotta say, I'm really enjoying Cassandra Nova on the Marauders team. I wasn't thinking I was gonna like that, but I'm enjoying it a lot more than I thought I would. So now I'm just intrigued to see some more villainous mutants find homes on superhero team rosters. Also, after Hellions, how could I not be rooting for Maddie? And villains in general. Hellions in general is just an amazing comic that will make you want villains on all of these superhero teams. And think of the drama now that we have Jean, Cyclops, and Havoc on this team. 
you add Maddie in there, it's like, woo, drama city. At number three is Darkseid. Originally introduced as a nearly unstoppable supervillain and one of the most powerful in the whole DC universe, Darkseid's powers have been dumbed down quite a bit since then. Although he appears the same, his immense power level just isn't the same these days as it always was. For example, his eye beams were originally meant to kill his targets in one hit, but these days, they don't by any means take out their targets in one hit. He used to be almost unbeatable, but it seems like heroes are making easier work of him than ever as of late. This is probably a result of him appearing more often in the comics, because if he'd kept his same unstoppable status, his his appearances would have to be regulated, or else our heroes would be out of commission in the blink of an eye. At number two is Anti-Monitor. Another case of a villain getting nerfed, Anti-Monitor's gotten it bad these days. If you thought Darkseid got taken down a notch, just think how much room there would be to do the same with Anti-Monitor. Because he is, after all, the most powerful being in the DC multiverse. Just to get an idea of what I mean, back in the day, Anti-Monitor takes out multiple universes alone before he reaches ours, and then once he does, it takes a hell of a lot to take him down. In fact, it became one of the most notable moments in all of the DC comics when they did because it was so difficult. But when he returns from his defeat and joins the Sinestro Corps, he just seems to be in a totally different echelon of power, a lesser one to the point where the Justice League can take him out on their own these days. Which is just weird to see for fans who knew his power level back in the day. At number one is the Batman who laughs. Enough with the downgrades because this guy's change is a glow up if I've ever seen one. These days the Batman who laughs has gained so much power that he's known to be basically godlike. And he finds these new powers in the place that he comes from, the Dark Multiverse. After finding a Dr. Manhattan powered Batman in the Dark Multiverse, the Batman who laughs gets his mind transferred into the body of that hero, acquiring the greater part of Dr. Manhattan's abilities, but with the sinister touch of his usual self as well. The only way that he's able to be taken down is when Wonder Woman finds a way to match his power level herself and defeats him despite his insane power boost. Number 10, Avengers Assemble. Something quite interesting that recently might help to turn the tides of the Avengers against the mutants as we head into AXE Judgment Day, which will see Avengers, X-Men, and Eternals fight against each other. Or Axe, if you prefer. I feel like I want to call this event Axe. Just sounds really epic. Iron Man recently discovered that Reed Richards had his mind altered by Professor X during a visit that Charles and Eric paid to him. This actually all came out in a brief joking exchange between the two. Well, Tony was trying to kind of like make some witty remarks with Reed, but Reed ended up just being like super straight up with him. Typical Reed fashion. Reed revealed to Tony that he had learned how to mask the X gene, but that both Magneto and Professor X were not fans of this research, and decided to punish Reed for meddling in mutant genetics by wiping the knowledge of how he did this from his mind. They didn't even bother to hide it from Reed, as they wanted him to live with the knowledge that they had and could do this again if needed. Needed. So now Tony knows, which means that the Avengers could have some more motivation for a reason to strike out against the X-Men. Also, if you missed when this whole thing even went down to begin with, you would want to check out X-Men slash Fantastic Four, which is where that all happened with Reed getting his mind wiped. Number 9, Moira McTaggart updates. A lot of stuff about Moira is rehashed in this issue, to help you get up to speed for any Moira updates that, you know, you may have missed. The revelation that Moira McTaggart was alive and well was recently revealed to other members of the Quiet Council, along with the discovery that she had actually become one of Mutantkind's greatest enemies, happening first in Inferno. And the revelation that Moira had possibly been driven mad by her mutant power of resurrection was first suggested in X-Men Red, with us learning of her mutant abilities first in House of X. Later, also alongside the discovery that she had become a robot near the end of the X deaths and 10 lives of Wolverine story. However, while all of this is rehashed and doesn't technically appear here first during the gala, for some of you who haven't been following as closely as perhaps someone like me who reads almost every mutant thing right now, but also that's kind of part of my job, this could definitely be considered an update revelation. Because you know, for some people, they didn't read Inferno, they maybe didn't even read House of X. Although if you haven't
haven't read House of X, what are you doing? Go back and read Powers of Ten and House of X, so good. And friends, before we move on to this next spot, if you are loving this list, and like I said, if you want that part two for Hellfire Gala updates from this year, I have so many more things that I wanted to include. So be sure to click like on this video and give us a comment below letting us know you want that. Number eight, Moira McTaggart joins Orcus. Something that is completely new, however, to the character is that Moira has joined Orcus. We knew that Moira was a villain, we knew that she was a robot, but we didn't know she joined up with Orcus to help them attack and destroy mutant kind. It does make sense though as a next step for her. Although it is terrifying to see these three major Orcus villains, Phalong, Dr. Stasis, and Moira working together. Moira appears to be helping them infiltrate the gala with her meat puppet, Mary Jane Watson, who we learn she had kidnapped during Free Comic Book Day and intended to wear as a suit in order to gain entry. MJ suit. It's quite a bold outfit. At number seven, we have Doomsday. The primary change with Doomsday isn't something that's been gained, but something that's been lost. A very notable power of his, actually, and that is his hyper adaptability. Ability. In fact, I would even argue that this was his main power. And what it meant was he could learn from past losses in battle and change his physiology to prevent himself from being killed in the same way twice. I don't know why this has been dropped because aside from it being the defining characteristic of Doomsday, it was just a really fun ability to watch because it made every encounter with the villain a new challenge for the heroes, which would ultimately make for an exciting read. But for whatever reason, this power has basically been left in the dust, making Doomsday that much less unique from any other bruiser type villain, at least in my opinion. At number six, we have Dr. Octopus. Something that the less avid readers may not know about this villain is that he's been going back and forth between heroism and villainy for some time now. And not only that, Otto Octavius has recently taken on the mantle of Spider-Man, donning the superior Spider-Man armor outfitted with the mechanical arms and everything. He's also been taken over by Venom recently, as well as the Carnage symbiote. Although he's known to be back to his evil ways and his classic suit in 2022, there is no telling if he'll jump back into the Spidey suit once more. He's already gone back and forth a number of times, even in the last few years, so I wouldn't be surprised if he did it again. At number five is the Green Goblin, aka Norman Osborn. As if this villain wasn't enough of a contender for Spidey to deal with before, he actually takes on the Carnage symbiote, turning him into the Red Goblin, as mentioned before. This makes him nearly unstoppable, forcing the good guys to employ anti-venom on him in order to take him out for good. And even though he has since gone back to being the Green Goblin, the character takes another turn that makes him unrecognizable from his past self during the events of Kindred Rising. And by unrecognizable, I mean that he's now working with Spider-Man. When Sin Eater cleanses Norman of his sins, his allegiances change and he becomes a hero. At number four, we have Doctor Doom. These days, Doctor Doom has taken on some pretty unstoppable powers that some would even describe as being godlike. Big fan Fans of Victor Von Doom might have expected him to reach a point like this at some point because of his insatiable hunger for power, but as of 2022, he's already surpassed at least my expectations of what he was capable of. Although they haven't stuck around until the time that we're posting this, he has taken the powers of the Silver Surfer and even the Beyonder, giving him a whole new mantle of God Emperor Doom during the Secret Wars storyline. Just for scale, this gave Doctor Doom the ability to piece together broken pieces of the universe after the multiversal collapse. And that's a pretty crazy glow up if you ask me. And even if he doesn't hold quite that much power these days, Having had that ability has changed the character forever, if you ask me. Number three, destruction of property. With the secret now publicly out that mutants have power over life and death with their resurrection protocols in place, Orcus is plotting some pretty diabolical actions in an attempt to fight back against the mutants. In the court of law, in this case. Because mutants can just resurrect, their plan is to help those being prosecuted for killing mutants by claiming the defense that really, as mutants can just be resurrected, at worst, their murder was instead just destruction of property. 
Wow, that is some severe dehumanizing stuff there. Dr. Stasis and the Orcus attorney team came up with this nasty stratagem, of course. Number two, Firestar Returns. Of course, what would the Hellfire Gala be without an X Men election? This year, fans of the comics still got to vote online to pick one member of the newest team. The nominees for us voting were Armor, Avalanche, Bling, Firestar, Gentle, Gorgon, Micromax, Penance, Siren, and Surge. And who won the fan vote? Well, I voted for Gentle, but Firestar won, aka Angelica Jones, which is also pretty awesome. Which means that Firestar also gets a dramatic reappearance here, with us also learning that she had never actually come to Krakoa until now. Never feeling the pull to join her mutant brethren, and feeling like she had kind of been judged for not coming out of the woodwork to join them. In the story, she was pressured into attending the gala by her good friend Iceman, and eventually caves and does decide to join him. Emma is eager to make amends with Firestar after years ago manipulating her when Firestar initially was a young, talented mutant and protege of Emma, who also trained alongside her Hellions team. In an attempt to make amends with Firestar, Emma takes Captain America's advice and decides to nominate her for a spot on the X-Men team. Surprisingly to both readers and likely some mutants on the island as well, she is elected. But like a good surprise. I think. Number 1. New X-Men Team Aside from Firestar being elected by fans to join, we also get a completely new X-Men roster. Well, a mostly new X-Men roster, as the X-Men election is now intrinsically tied apparently to the Hellfire Gala. At least it is so far. Cyclops, Jean, and Sync decide to stay on the team, which seems to imply that they don't need to be re-elected. Although if they did have to be re-elected, I would be kind of surprised. Cyclops is known to be the one responsible for the secret of mutant resurrection being released to the world which means that a lot of mutants are not very happy with him this year. Nominated to join and those who end up elected are Forge, who is nominated by Cyclops, Havoc, who is in turn nominated by Forge, Magic, who is self-nominated, and Iceman, who is also self-nominated. I didn't think you could nominate yourself for the X-Men election, but apparently you can. Also, I guess people were just like, yeah, I don't want to fight Magic and I don't want to fight Iceman over it, so we'll just let them be on. It's fine. <laughs> 